Hello everyone. This lecture is going to provide uh, two foundations for you. The first is a foundational knowledge in what it takes to belong to kingdom animalia. So what are the fundamental synapomorphies that most animals, if not all animals, share? We're also going to be examining a subset of those synapomorphies that focus specifically on the embryological development of animals. There's a lot of characteristics during development that show up in lineage after lineage of animals. And it's not an unfair conclusion to say that they are probably all ancestral and signs that animals inherited these characteristics from a common ancestor. We'll start with an introduction to the characteristics common within kingdom animalia. These are uniting features that exhibit the relationships between animals. First off, all animals are eukaryotic. This means that their cells have a nucleus, which is where DNA is contained. It's where it's housed within the cell. They also have these structures called organelles. From the name, you're probably thinking organs, and you're not far off. Organelle is French for little organs, and these structures serve the same basic purpose in a cell as they do in our bodies. Organs perform specific tasks for us, such as digestion, energy processing, uh, waste removal, and the organelles in cells do similar things, but for the cell. All animals are also multicellular. Now we've talked about this before, but being multicellular doesn't just mean your body is made of one individual cell or many individual cells. Being multicellular doesn't mean that your body is just made of many cells, even though that's what the name sounds like. Being multicellular means your body is made of many types of cells. One of the hallmarks of multicellular organisms is what's called specialization. Cells are specialized on specific tasks and they give up their ability to do other tasks in order to become really, really good at just one. So the cells that are found in muscles are excellent at contraction and movement, but they really suck at things like energy processing or waste removal. They can't do the job of, say, a liver cell or a heart cell. They're specialized on doing their one cell or their one job as a muscle cell. Unicellular organisms have cells that can do all jobs. Every cell in the body of a unicellular organism is basically the same. They're all capable of doing everything. Energy processing, waste removal, movement, you name it. Each cell has to do all of those tasks. In a multicellular organism, you've got a distribution of labor. Cells are doing different jobs and specializing on them, which means the cells in a multicellular organism are codependent. They can't live alone. They rely on each other for survival. All animals are also what's called heterotrophic. Let's break that word down. Hetero means other or different. And trophic, you can think of as feeding or feeder. It means to eat or to feed. So what this word breaks down to is other feeder. It means that animals have to consume other living things in order to get their energy. The opposite of heterotrophic is not homotrophic, although that would make logical sense. Instead, it's autotrophic. If you think about it, the word homotrophic would actually translate to same feeder which kind of sounds like cannibalism to me. The other, or the other organisms on the planet don't consume each other, their same species for energy. Instead, they make their own energy molecules. So they don't have to consume any other organism to get their energy. They make those molecules themselves. Auto means self. These are self feeders. 
You can probably guess this refers mostly to plants and photosynthetic microorganisms like algae. But all animals, to be an animal, you've got to be a heterotroph. Animals also feed by a process called ingestion. Think in as in inside. The vast majority of animals bring energy sources, meaning food, inside their bodies to break them down and then absorb the nutrients out of that food. Heterotrophs, such as animals, frequently have to store energy in some form. In the case of kingdom animalia, Carbohydrates, which are sugar molecules, the primary source of energy from our food, they're stored in the form of a molecule called glycogen. Glycogen is stored right near the muscles, which are usually the organs that consume the glycogen most rapidly. Plants also have a similar molecule they use for energy storage, but it's structured differently. That's called starch. All animals, are also mobile during at least one life stage. And mobile doesn't just mean they are moved through their environment. It means they are somewhat capable of moving themselves. All right, here's some characteristics that all animals share. No animals have cell walls surrounding their cells. In plants, the cell wall is this really rigid structure that surrounds the outside of the cell. Just inside of that cell wall is a flexible membrane that is conveniently called the cell membrane. The cell wall in plants is rigid, it's strong, and it's what actually gives the plant its structural support. You can think of it almost like the plant's skeleton. Animal cells, though, don't have that support barrier. They don't have a cell wall. Animal cells look a little more like this, and all they have is that cell membrane. And that cell membrane is squishy and flexible. So the cells don't really support themselves very well. If you want a body to have lots of structure and to be large in size, that body's gonna be made up of millions or billions of cells, and they're gonna need some sort of structural support built around them so the body maintains its shape. Otherwise, you're just gonna have a gooey pile of cells sitting on the ground. The support for animals comes from something called the extracellular matrix. Extra means outside, and cellular just refers to cells. A matrix you can think of as sort of a scaffold. If you look at this uh, support structure from a glass sponge, which is a hexactinellid within phylum periphera, you'll see that this looks like a series of support structures that have been woven together. That's what a matrix looks like. It's regular, it's structured, and it exists outside the cells of this animal. The cells sit inside of little cavities within this matrix. The walls of the matrix are what hold the cells in place and give them support and structure. This structural support system, it can be rigid, like what you see here in the picture. This is made out of silica, hence the name glass sponge. Glass is also based on silica. This is a very fragile skeleton, but it's rigid and hard. Not all animals, though, use rigid materials for their extracellular matrix. 
Structural proteins, especially collagen, collagen is a characteristic of animals. It's a defining character. These structural proteins act sort of like ropes or nets that are woven together around the cells to hold them in place. So you can have extracellular matrices made either of these strong but very flexible structural proteins or hardened solid minerals like the silica you see here or the calcium that you might see in the bones of vertebrates like us. Another characteristic of the vast majority of animals is that they have some form of sexual reproduction, meaning you have two cells containing DNA, one from each parent, that contribute to the genetic makeup of a new offspring. The cells that are used for reproduction are called gametes. We know these most commonly as sperm and egg. But what's interesting about animals is that our gametes are heterogamous. Hetero again means different. Gamus in this case refers to gametes. It means the gametes look different from each other. The gamete normally produced by females is called the egg, and it is significantly larger than the gamete produced by males, which is called sperm. But it takes an egg and a sperm cell combined to make a new offspring. Now, asexual reproduction also is present in many lineages of animals. This is where two contributions of DNA, one from two different individuals, isn't necessary. All the DNA for a new offspring, for a new individual, can come from one parent. So no sex is necessary. We'll go into details on how that works when we get to the reproduction lecture. And finally, tissues. Tissues are sets of cells that are all specialized to do the same job. Tissues combine to form organs. Your heart is made of cardiac tissue or heart tissue. Cardiac tissue is made up of heart cells, cardiac cells. And all those cells are specialized to do the same job. Tissues are present in all groups of animals except periphera. And that's critical to remember. Peripherans do not have tissues. And we'll talk about why in a couple of slides. Right. We've discussed this a little already in the classification lecture, but as a reminder, we are fairly certain that all animals are monophyletic, meaning they have a single shared ancestor. Likely, this common ancestor looks a whole lot like modern-day coenoflagellates. We've likely already talked about this in the sponges lab. Coenoflagellates are a type of protist, so they're not part of kingdom animalia. They're a complete sister taxon to the animals, okay? So they are part of kingdom protista. I'll write protists here to remind you. little messy, but you got it. <laughs> we think that the ancestor to, have, to all of these groups look like coenoflagellates because modern day sponges have these specialized cells called coenocytes that look almost identical to coenoflagellate protists, which are in a completely different kingdom. The specific form taken by this ancestor probably wasn't a single cell, but instead a colony of cells, all of which had flagella, so we say they're flagellated, and they likely belonged to Kingdom Protista, so they were protists. This ancestor also probably evolved in the ocean. This would explain why the majority of modern animal species are marine or ocean dwelling. What's really interesting is, although we interact mostly with terrestrial animals, ones that live on land, hence the prefix terra, 
they make up a relatively new and relatively small proportion of the animal kingdom. Truly terrestrial animals only come from five different phyla. There's the mollusca or the mollusks. Think land snails, like what you have in your garden. There are the annelids, so think earthworms. There are the anicophorans, which we're not actually going to focus on, so I'm not going to go into them, but you can look up that phylum if you're interested. Then we have the arthropods, so think insects. And there's a few other terrestrial arthropods too, but we'll talk about those in the arthropod lab. And then finally, the chordates, which is probably most of what we think of when we think of terrestrial life. Think of birds, reptiles, mammals, and amphibians. That's not many phyla compared to the rest of the animal kingdom. Also keep in mind, all of these phyla have numerous groups that are marine or freshwater dwelling. Okay, so these are not purely terrestrial phyla. They just happen to have our lone examples of terrestrial life. There are a few characteristics that we are going to use to actually map out the evolution of animal diversity. The first of these characteristics is what's called symmetry. Symmetry is when you can take an object, identify its midpoint, and see if you draw a line through that midpoint if the two sides match. Okay. If they do, you have found a symmetric object. If they don't, your two sides here clearly do not match, what you have found is an asymmetric object. There are different kinds of symmetry. Interestingly though, our oldest group of animals, the peripherans, they lack symmetry of any sort. Putting an A in front of a word means without. Asymmetry means lacking in symmetry. But after the peripherans evolved, a form of symmetry shows up in our animal lineage. It's called radial symmetry. Think radial as in radius, like the radius of a circle. So if I draw a circular shape, find the midpoint, and draw a line through it, I do get two sides that match. But what if I drew a line here? Will I still get two sides that match? Yep, definitely. If I draw a line here, yep. I would still get two sides that match. Radial symmetry is circular symmetry. As long as you're drawing a line through the midpoint of your radially symmetric organism, the two sides are going to match up. Okay. Radial symmetry is our ancestral form of animal symmetry. Radially symmetric animals have a top and a bottom, but no sides. Think about it, if I just draw a circle here, which of these sides is the left or the right? I don't know, what if you were to rotate it 90 degrees? That could change where left and right are. There's no landmarks on this circle. Every side is the same. But if I were to draw that organism from the side, let's pretend it's a jellyfish, I can easily identify that there is a top and a bottom to this animal. But I couldn't tell you where, what side on this jellyfish was its left or its right side. It has circular symmetry. Left and right don't exist. All you have are top and bottom. 
Our only modern phyla of animals that still have radial symmetry are the nadarians and the tenophores. Radial symmetry very quickly evolved into what's called bilateral symmetry. The remaining phyla of animals, except for one, all have bilateral symmetry still. We call this group the bilateria. We call our two phyla that have radial symmetry the radiata. Okay. So the radiata make up, or I should say, the radiata consist of just nadarians and tenophores. The bilateria consist of all of these phyla that you see over here in the blue boxes. Bilateral symmetry is when you have two sides that match. This is a strange looking little butterfly. But if I were to draw a line down the midpoint of this butterfly, the midpoint's right there, if I were to draw a line like this, I would create two sides that definitely match, so it's a symmetric animal. But if I were to draw a line like this, these two sides don't match. There's only one way I can bisect this animal such that it has two sides. That's it. Or two sides that match, I should say. Okay. This animal only has two matching sides. Bi meaning two, lateral meaning sides. It's in the name. Mm -hmm. This animal has a left side and a right side. Mm -hmm. This is actually the animal's right side if it's facing us. This is its left, again, if it's facing us. Also has a top and a bottom here and here. And it has a front and a back. So if this little butterfly is looking at us, here's its eyes. What we're seeing is its front side. On the opposite side is its back. You get all of this once you have bilateral symmetry. This is actually what allowed for a very, very important characteristic, which is cephalization. That's the process of growing a head. Heads are usually where animals aggregate things like their sensory organs and the neurological tissue they use for processing information, what we would call a brain. This increases the efficiency of things like interpreting information from the environment which allows animals to make complex choices much faster. We have one more group, which has our final form of symmetry. It's called pentaradial symmetry, and it's a derived form of bilateral symmetry. Okay, so pentaradial evolved from bilateral. Penta means five. Radial, again, means circular. These are animals that have five-part circular symmetry. So if you identify their midpoint, you'll find that their body can be divided into five separate pieces. Only echinoderms have this kind of symmetry. Echinoderms are things like sea stars. There you go, kind of a messy drawing, but you can see it. There's the midpoint. One, two, three, four, five components. Sand dollars are very similar. Okay. If you look closely, you'll notice they have what almost looks like a little miniature sea star on the top. This divides the sand dollars into five pieces, which is reflected in their internal anatomy. So only echinoderms, though, have this pentaradial symmetry. Okay, they're right up here. The next set of characteristics we're going to use to examine the shared ancestry of all animals actually all occur during embryonic development. What you see here is a visualization of the earliest stages of embryonic development that are shared by almost all animals. We're going to encounter a breakpoint right here. Up to this point, all the stages of development depicted here 
exist in every animal phylum for, from periphera on up to chordata. But after this point, not all phyla are going to exhibit these last two stages of development that are labeled as early gastrula and gastrula. So let's take a look at the stages that are shared across all animal phyla. The, the first is called the zygote. A zygote is a fertilized egg. <coughs> a fertilized egg is what you get after an egg cell and a sperm cell fuse together during sexual reproduction. It's a single cell. Okay. And instead of calling it a fertilized egg, of course, it's science. We give it a more complex name. We just call it a zygote. This zygote is the start of our developmental process. It's going to undergo what's called cleavage. Cleavage is when the cell divides into two equal halves. After cleavage has occurred, what you wind up with are two new cells. Each are half the size of the original zygote. We call this the two cell stage. That two cell stage of development is also going to undergo cleavage. Both cells are going to divide in half. That's going to give us a single embryo made of four cells, each of which is half the size of the two cell stage, and each of which is, is a quarter of the size of the original zygote. I'm referring to these by a specific term that you should know. These are now embryos. This pattern is going to continue. The four cell stage will undergo cleavage. All four of these cells will divide in half, giving us a total of eight. Each of these eight cells is half the size of the cells in the four cell stage. Each of these eight cells is a quarter of the size in the two cell stage, and each one is an eighth of the size of the zygote. So you can kind of see how this pattern progresses. From eight cells, we would go to a 16 cell stage. From 16, we'd go to a 32 cell stage, then a 64 cell stage, on and on, until you reach a solid, large ball of teeny tiny little cells, which we refer to as a morula. So this whole thing is a morula. What's important to know is that it is solid. If I were to cut this morula in half and look inside, it would look like this. No empty space, no gaps. That's a solid ball. That's important to understand because it's going to change. The morula is going to undergo a number of cleavage events until it becomes a hollow ball called a blastula. So what happens is that over the course of many different cleavage events, a little open space forms in the middle of your morula. And that open space eventually gets bigger and bigger as more and more cleavage events occur. So hopefully you can see that we go from a solid ball to a ball with a tiny gap in the middle to a ball with a larger gap and larger until eventually what you wind up with is a ball with a large gap in the middle, big old empty space, and a layer of cells that surround it that are only one cell thick. Imagine a beach ball. 
This one cell thick layer is the plastic on the outside of the beach ball. This hollow space on the inside is the inside of the beach ball that you fill with air in order to blow it up. That's your blastula. Every phylum of animal has a blastula during its developmental stage, peripherans on up to chordates. But nadarians, platyhelminthes, nematodes, arthropods, essentially every phylum except periphera has additional stages after the blastula. Peripherans stop, or I should say, peripherans have the blastula stage, but nothing after it. They end here. Every other phylum, though, goes through these last two stages of development, which are all part of a process called gastrulation, the formation of what's called a gastrula, this last stage. During gastrulation, one side of the embryo starts to cave in. So imagine taking your finger and pushing it in on one side of your beach ball, forcing the plastic of the ball upwards into the air-filled cavity. Imagine pushing hard enough that you cave in a big area of that beach ball. Your thumb would be in this, or finger would be in this space, pushing up on the plastic. This would be the air-filled space that was previously the inside of your beach ball. And this would be the part of the beach ball that's still on the surface, on the outside. This is how gastrulation works. A one side of your gastrula folds inside the ball of the gastrula itself creating a double layer of cells. One that forms this internal hump and one that forms this external surface. Mm -hmm. This creates new spaces, new regions in your embryo. On your blastula, you had essentially two regions. You had this layer of cells on the outside and then you had this open space on the inside that's just filled with fluid, nothing living in there. Your cells that are part of your outside layer, these guys, they all exist in functionally the same place, outside that outer layer of cells. Remember, this thing is a sphere. There's no top or bottom to it. There's no left or right. It's just a big sphere. These cells all exist in the same place on that sphere, the outer surface. But once gastrulation has occurred, now you've got more than one location where a cell can be. You've still got outside. This outer layer is one location where you can find cells. But now you've also got this inner layer. Cells can now be inside your embryo or outside in or out. You still have empty space that's just filled with fluid too. You also now have empty space inside this region that you caved in. This is where your finger would have been if this was the beach ball. There's also now that empty space. So you've got lots and lots of locations now, whereas previously you only had two. We give terms, of course, to all of these locations because it's science, we like to name things. This space on the innermost, or this innermost space where your finger would have been located, that's called the archenteron or archenteron. The opening to it, the point where your finger would have entered into this space, that's called the blastopore. Pores are generally holes, okay, gaps in things. Now here's why all this matters. Gastrulation is what allows for cells to specialize. They're able to specialize and develop into different types of cells based on their location inside the embryo. Remember, 
in your blastula, you had only one location where cells could be. Outside. That was it. Now you've got two locations. Cells can be outside or inside. Having two locations means you can have at least two different types of cells that develop. We call these two layers of cells, the outer layer and the inner layer, germ layers. And germ layers are what are going to allow us to form tissues or groups of specialized cells. Gastrulation is absent in periphera. They don't go through it, which is why peripherins lack tissues. No gastrulation, no germ, no germ layers. No germ layers, no tissues. Our earliest animals likely only had this inner and outer layer of cells, just this simple gastrula. We still have some of those phyla around today. They're the nadarians and the tenophores. And because they only have two germ layers in their embryos, we say they are diploblastic, di meaning two. Those two germ layers are separated by that empty space that's up here, the air-filled space that was inside our beach ball. That empty space is called the blastocele, the blastocele, and it's filled with non-living material. It might be air, it might be fluid, no matter what it is though, it's not living. Our two germ layers are named based on their location. The endoderm is in yellow here. It's the innermost layer. Endo means inside. The ectoderm is external. It's this outermost layer. Now to understand the diagram on the bottom, imagine I take this embryo up here and I cut it in half like this. And then we look down from above at this cut half. Okay, it'll look like a sphere, because remember this is a circle, a spherical object I've cut in half. So its cross section will look circular, and that's what you're seeing here as viewed from above. The archenteron or archenteron is this open space in here, that's this innermost circle. Then you have the endoderm that surrounds it. It's the yellow layer of cells, which is depicted in green here. Then you have this empty space, which is our non-living blastocele. And then finally, you've got the blue cells along the outermost edge, which is the ectoderm. Some of these spaces have very predictable and very important developmental fates, meaning we can already determine what they're going to grow into in the adult animal. The endoderm here, this is going to grow into your digestive tract. This open space in the middle formed by the archenteron, that's going to become what we call your digestive cavity. This is the open space inside your digestive organs. The open space in your mouth where food initially enters your digestive tract, the open space inside your esophagus that food has to travel through to get down to the empty space inside your stomach, so on and so forth. There's got to be empty space in your digestive organs for the food to move through. That empty space originates here. The ectoderm, on the other hand, develops into your body covering. For us, it would be skin and hair and sweat glands. For reptiles, it would be scales and a skin layer under that. For insects, it would be their exoskeleton. Whatever your body covering is, 
it derives from your ectoderm when you're an embryo. Now notice I said only nadarians and tenophores were diploblastic. That's because our diploblastic ancestor evolved into a more complex embryo called a triploblastic embryo. Tri meaning three. You've got three embryonic tissue layers here, three germ layers. The ectoderm in blue and the endoderm in green are still present, but notice we have added a middle layer in red. That middle layer is the mesoderm, meso meaning middle. All bilaterally symmetric taxa, including echinoderms, who remember their ancestors were bilaterally symmetric, all of them are triploblastic. So basically every group except for peripherans, nadarians, and tenophores. Notice that the mesoderm replaces the blastocele. There's no blastocele in your triploblastic embryo. The mesoderm, it's going to develop into organs other than digestive or body covering. So other organ systems are going to come from this mesoderm. When you map these three developmental pathways onto a cladogram for kingdom animalia, they map out nice and clean. You have no tissues in your first groups, which are your outgroup and your oldest animals, the peripherans. Then tissues evolve down here because of the rise of gastrulation. Gastrulation evolves right about there. Then you've got your diploblastic animals, nadarians and tenophores. But after that, your third tissue layer shows up, the mesoderm, giving rise to your triploblastic lineages. Notice how nicely this overlaps with our symmetry uh, characteristic. Your asymmetric animals also have no tissues. Your radially symmetric animals are diploblastic your bilaterally symmetric animals are triploblastic. The traits tend to follow each other. It's very convenient. Our next topic relates to these germ layers and one of the first body structures they create, which is called a body cavity. These body cavities are the open spaces inside the body that, uh, that organs occupy. The body cavity is formally known as a coelom, and that's the term that I want you to use, is coelom. Most bilaterally symmetric triploblastic animals have a coelom. It's either fluid or air-filled, and it's open space. It separates your digestive tract from your body wall. It okay, keeps them physically separated from each other. And it forms from the mesoderm, which is why nadarians and tenophores don't have it. They're diploblastic. They lack the mesoderm. I'm going to skip ahead two slides, three slides, and show you what the oldest form of a coelom probably looked like. A coelomates are a group of organisms primarily consist of the platyhelminthes. Which are our flatworms. A means without. These animals don't have a true coelom. They lack a true body cavity. There's no empty space surrounding the digestive tract. So if you look at this little flatworm down here, this is a planarian. If we bisect him, cut him in half, and then look into his body, what we'll see is that his skin is derived from his ectoderm. 
Here in the middle, this yellow circle represents the digestive system, and then the digestive cavity is in there. And notice the space in between the body covering and the digestive cavity is absolutely full of this red material. That's all mesoderm. In the adult animal, it'll be muscle, more or less solid muscle. No empty space at all. The digestive cavity is connected on all sides to mesoderm, and the mesoderm is connected on all sides to the ectoderm. This is a solid body. It's solid tissue, bottom to top. The animals that evolved after the acelomates started to have actual silomic space, empty space. pseudo -celomates are phyla like the nematodes, nematoda. They have a coelom. They've got empty space in here. See that? That white? That's empty space. In the middle here, we've got our digestive tract. Again, the digestive cavity, the open space in the middle is there. We've got the body covering around the outside. And then we have this thin layer of mesoderm that surrounds on the inside the body covering. The body covering is internally lined with mesoderm. Then you get this gap, empty space. Mm -hmm. That's what we call a pseudo -celum. If you guys just want to refer to it as a coelom, that's totally fine. We say it's a pseudo -celum because a true coelom actually gets more complex as time goes on, meaning evolutionary time. You'll see on the next slide. The way that we describe a pseudo -celum is that it's empty space which is lined on the outside with mesoderm and on the inside with endoderm. Remember, the coelom itself is empty space. So what surrounds this empty space, this white area? Well, on the outside of it is mesoderm and on the inside of it is endoderm. So that's how we formally define it. This allows, or this organization of a coelom, where you have mesoderm, which frequently will grow into connective tissue, just on the outer margin of your coelom, it allows for a lot of mobility for the digestive tract. The digestive tract isn't anchored in place. It can move around inside all of that salomic space. The most advanced coelom to evolve is just called a true coelom, and the phyla who have it are referred to as coelomates. In a true coelomate, like this earthworm, you have your digestive tract in the middle with the digestive cavity there, you got your body wall along the outside edge, and then you have mesoderm lining the inner surface of your ectoderm, and you have mesoderm surrounding your endoderm with connectors at the top and the bottom. So just to make this totally clear, you still have white space, empty space, that's the margin of the empty space on the right side of this animal. Here's the margin of the empty space on the left side. That's the coelom. And all that empty space is surrounded on all sides by mesoderm. Okay? No matter where you are on the edge of this coelom, of this empty space, there's mesoderm surrounding you. And notice that the mesoderm surrounding the digestive tract is anchored to the mesoderm lining the inside of the body wall. The mesoderm connects what we call dorsally and ventrally. These are terms we use to describe a location on an animal. So let me draw you a little diagram here real quick.
You have it's a somewhat strange little animal. <laughs> yeah, good enough. Okay. On this animal, you have a top surface and a bottom surface. This top side we refer to as the dorsal side. Think dorsal fin like on a shark or on a porpoise, dolphin. The belly side is called the ventral side. And these are terms you need to know, dorsal and ventral. We also have a front and a back. The front or head end of an animal is called its anterior end. The back side is called the posterior end. So dorsally and ventrally mean top and bottom. That's where these connections are in the mesoderm. This helps anchor the organs in place and keep them stationary. Those are your three types of coelom. True coelums, pseudocelums, and acelums. If we map those onto a tree, you see that these actually map out quite conveniently as well. Peripherans don't have tissues, so they're not going to have a coelom. Nadarians and tenophores don't have a mesoderm, so they won't have a coelom. Platyhelminthes are flatworms, are acelomates. Nematodes and their sister groups are our pseudocelomates. And everybody else is a true coelomate. So the true coelom evolves right here. The final category of developmental characteristics we need to discuss apply just to the bilateria. You can divide this group, the bilateria, into two subgroups. Okay? You can consider each of these to be a clade. The first are called the protostomes. Second are called the deuterostomes. Protostomes and deuterostomes have a series of developmental differences that are very obvious. The first has to do with that early opening in the gastrula that I showed you several slides ago. Okay. So remember I said this internal space is the archenteron. And that this opening to the archenteron was called the blastopora. The blastopora is the first opening, the first hole to show up on an embryo. What I haven't shown you yet is how this gastrula continues to develop. This area continues to cave in until that inner layer of endoderm touches this upper layer of ectoderm and they fuse together. And it creates an embryo that in cross section looks like this. There's a hole here and a hole here. I know that is slightly confusing. Imagine you have an apple or a tennis ball and you have drilled a hole through the middle of it. So you've got a hole on the top of your ball and then a hole down here on the bottom. And imagine if you could stick a straw or another tube down the middle of your tennis ball. That tube would go all the way through until it popped out the other side. That's what your final stage gastrula looks like. It looks like a tennis ball with a straw rammed through the center of it. These two openings, here and here, those are going to be the openings into your digestive tract. The first one to form is the blastopore. The blastopore is going to become either the mouth or the anus on your adult animal. The other opening will become then 
the other opening. So if the blastopore is the mouth, your other opening will be the anus. Okay. Protostomes have a blastopore that becomes their mouth. Their second opening then becomes the anus. Deuterostomes are the opposite. The blastopore becomes the anus and the second opening becomes the mouth. It's inverted. That's the first difference between these two groups. The next major set of differences have to do with the process of cleavage. In protostomes, something called spiral cleavage occurs. In spiral cleavage, each subsequent layer of cells that are created as cleavage occurs are rotated about 90 degrees relative to the row below. So if you look at the diagram down here, this bottommost layer of cells looks like this if viewed from above. Mm -hmm. But if we add on a second layer of cells, if all those cells undergo cleavage and create a new layer, that layer is going to sit like this on top of our existing layer. It's going to be rotated relative to the layer below. And you can see that here, that it's rotated just a bit. The center of these two cells is here, but on this layer, the centers are down here. They kind of look like bricks in a brick wall. So if you ever draw bricks in a diagram or if you drew them as a kid on a cartoon, you probably drew them like that. They're off center from each other. That's what the eight cell and 16 cell stages of a protostome embryo look like. The cells are off center from each other, from layer to layer. Deuterostomes have what's called radial cleavage. In radial cleavage, your layers of cells sit cleanly on top of each other and they line up. They are perfectly stacked, one on top of the next. So if you were to do this using bricks, they would look like this, just look like a grid, okay? That's radial cleavage, and you see that in the eight and 16 cell stages of deuterostomes. Protostomes also have a different cell fate during early development than deuterostomes do. Cell fate literally refers to what the cell Can develop into. Protostomes exhibit what's called determinate cell fate. This means that a cell's job is determined during the very early stages of development. So we're talking eight cell stage or 16 cell stage. These cells that you're seeing in this diagram down here it's already been determined what they're going to do. This cell might become a skin cell. Well, these cells down here, they might be predetermined to become stomach cells. Usually the jobs aren't this specific yet, but they could be. Okay. What this means is that this individual cell that I'm highlighting in blue, all it knows how to do is be a skin cell. Okay. If it were to break off and float away, it would not be able to grow into a whole organism because all it knows how to do is grow into skin and skin can't survive on its own without the rest of the body. This cell would die right? because these early cells in a protostome embryo have determinate cell fate. Deuterostomes though are different. Deuterostomes have indeterminate cell fate early in development. Deuterostome cells retain what's called totipotency. If you break that word down, 
you get toady, which means total, and think potent. Okay? Potent means possibilities. Okay? All possibilities remain open to these cells in early development. It means this individual cell, which I'll highlight in purple, doesn't have a job yet. It could grow into anything. It could be skin, it could be stomach, it could be brain, it could be anything. It hasn't been determined yet. So if this purple cell were to break away on its own, it could actually grow into a whole nother embryo. This is actually how identical twins form. You have one embryo that loses a cell, and that cell grows into a second embryo. You still have your original, number one, but now you have a new one, number two, and they'll grow up to be twins. The reason this can happen is because this new cell that broke off, it's basically a new zygote. And it develops like another zygote. There's one more major difference between protostomes and deuterostomes. It's how the coelom develops. Protostomes undergo what's called schizocelous development. Deuterostomes undergo what's called enterocelous development. We'll start with protostomes. In schizocelous development, the, while the gastrula is still forming, so we're still pushing this endoderm up towards the top of the embryo, it's not fully uh, complete yet, you have early mesoderm cells that break off from the endoderm. So these little cells here, they broke away, fractured from the endoderm, and they are what become the mesoderm. They're gonna grow into it. So say we take this embryo, and we cut it in half, and then look at it from above. That's gonna be this diagram, okay, seen from above. So your blastopore is what leads into your open space here. Remember, we're seeing the endoderm here from above. When viewed from above, here's what it looks like as the coelom develops. Those early mesoderm cells are first going to form solid chunks that as they grow will slowly hollow out until they look like this. Kind of like how the, blast, the um, blastula developed. Okay. So this open space will slowly get bigger and bigger as the mesoderm expands. Okay. Until what you wind up with is what looks like this. All of this open space in here, which is the coelom, surrounded by this red mesoderm. Okay. Interocelous development is subtly different. In enterocelous development, cells don't break off from the endoderm to form the mesoderm. Instead, you get these pouches that form. They almost look like ears growing along the edges of the endoderm. Those pouches form and are pushed out as they grow until they separate completely and become little free-floating bubbles of mesoderm filled with empty space. That's what you're seeing here. Those bubbles are going to grow and grow until they look like this. Now notice the end result is the same in both of these processes. 
you get a developing coelom, looks exactly the same, end result is identical. It's how you get there that differs. This is a nice overview diagram showing you these major differences between protostomes and deuterostomes. Notice that before the eight cell stage, their development is identical. Yeah? But at the eight cell stage is when things change. Spiral cleavage in the protostomes, radial cleavage in the deuterostomes. Yeah? The blastula, however, is the same. Notice that the morula is different because of that arrangement of cells, spiral versus radial. The blastula is the same. The next set of differences is how the coelom develops. And so how is the mesoderm formed? Broken off or pouched? Then how does the mesoderm split and expand? But then this final stage, it's almost identical except for what forms from the blastopore. So for protostomes, it's the mouth. For deuterostomes, it's the anus. And then the opposite opening fulfills the opposite function. All right. This next section, embryology and phylogenetics, you will not be tested on. We're not going to cover it formally in class, but I provide you with it because it's an interesting introduction to evolutionary um, developmental studies. So if you found this stuff interesting and you'd like to know more about how it relates to phylogenies, how it relates to classification and our understanding of evolution, these topics covered in this section are a really nice place to start. Okay. Evolutionary embryology has been used to study the development of animals. Okay. Also, why animals develop the way they do. Section 4.6 introdu introduces you to the concept of heterochrony. This also we will not cover in class. But if you're interested in developmental timing, why certain parts of animals uh, retain their juvenile traits while other parts grow to be more adult-like, all of that is covered in the field of um, heterochrony studies. So this is an introduction to it. This last slide is going to show up in our morphology lecture. It's here as a transition from uh, evolutionary embryology into our next topic of morphology. So know that it's here. It'll be present again in our next lecture, so you are responsible for it. All right, that's it for today.